you very much for that introduction, Jeremy. Um, so welcome. We're a team of four Masters of Electronic Engineering students at the University of Southampton, and today we'll be talking about our final year group project, AI Acceleration on the Open Hardware Group CV32E40X core using the extension interface. This is a 12-week project, which we began in October at the start of this academic year, undertaken by the four of us under the supervision of Professor Mark Zwinski. To introduce ourselves briefly, my name is Iwana, I'm the project lead, and I worked on the physical implementation. My name is Kunal, and I worked on the implementation of the extension interface. My name is Adonis, and I focus on the software aspects of the project. My name is Yu, and I worked on the AI Accelerator. Our project is a contribution to the Open Hardware Group, a non-profit global organization developing open source IP and hardware risk v cores. Both our university and industrial clients, Embercosm, are members of the group, with Embercosm, as Jeremy introduced, developing open source compiler tool chains. Their CEO, Dr. Jeremy Bennett, and head of AI, Dr. William Jones, have been our key source of support. We'll first share our motivations for choosing this project. Uh, and what we aim to achieve in our specification, discussing all the background needed for our project. Then we'll delve into the technical work, look at the simulation of a new core from the Open Hardware Group, implementing the Open Hardware Group's new extension interface, and porting a vector accelerator to this interface. Finally, we will discuss our results from benchmarking the system using the MLPerf Tiny Suite and the conclusions drawn from our project. This project is on the bleeding edge of development in embedded machine learning, which is an emerging technology that is growing in interest with the current boom in Internet of Things devices. By decoupling IoT devices from the cloud, processing on the edge brings key advantages, such as security improvements by decreasing the scope of the attack surfaces, decreases in power consumption, increasing their usage time, and reductions in latency, which are extremely important if your IT device is being used in security critical applications. On top of this, consumers are more likely to trust new technologies if they know their data is being processed solely within the device itself. One solution for keeping up with these rapid developments is, of course, using the RISC-V instruction set architecture, whose enormous flexibility makes it ideal for emerging technologies, allowing for custom extensions to be added to the ISA. So to give a very basic overview, Machine learning al algorithms apply learned models to generally generate useful output from input data. The simple can take many different shapes, including time series or images, as long as the data are encoded in a form suitable for the model. Artificial neural networks offer one approach to machine learning that has gained a lot of traction. These take the form of interconnected nodes whose layered interactions can apply nonlinear functions to the input. The weights of the model can be trained to achieve the desired output, whether that's pattern recognition in audio streams or object detection in images. And inference is a term given to the process of applying this trained model to previously unseen inputs to generate an output. In other words, to infer from the input data. The operations involved in machine learning can be incredibly compute intensive, so often they're performed on power hungry machines in the cloud. However, Novel computer architectures allow inference to be effectively performed directly on edge devices. Um, how do we achieve this by utilizing the open source nature of RISC-V? The Open Hardware Group has multiple cores at different stages in development, and relevant to our project is the CV32 32-bit family of embedded cores. The flagship of this line is the core as seen on the right side of the screen, designed for general purpose compute at the edge. This core is fully verified and currently being prepared for tape out. Now, let's tie this into the work that preceded this project. A previous group developed the AI Vector Accelerator, or AVA, to interface with this flagship core and simulated the operation of the full system in Verilator. Following on from this, another project managed to synthesize the core on an FPGA. The AVA achieved significant performance improvements in inference, but these required extensive modifications to the core itself, which are undesirable as they are time consuming to implement and test. One costly aspect of the previous system integration was the use of the OBI multiplexer to allow for memory access by both the core and AVA. Arbitrating memory access in this way, however, required the pipeline to be flushed during execution of any instruction on AVA. This therefore reduced the potential efficiency of the overall system. Since then, a new core has been developed. From the same family of cores, 
the E4TX is at a much earlier stage of development. Aside from augmenting the memory access architecture of the core, this new core brings the addition of the X or extension interface. This provides a standard interface over which to offload instructions to coprocessors. And with this, the modifications to the core itself would be minimal or non-existent. With this available in an open source format, individuals and companies all around the world would have a platform from which to begin developing heterogeneous architectures and to bring edge computing to life. It's important to note that, that the design and implementation of both the E4TX and extension interface have been under development for the full duration of our project and continue to change now. We have used this interface ourselves to provide hardware acceleration of the inference on the E4TX core. Our initial plan dictated four technical objectives. To implement the X interface for the E4TX core, to adapt the AVA coprocessor to use the extension interface to synthesize the system on an FPGA, and to evaluate the system's performance using a standard benchmark for machine learning inference. The first significant challenge we faced was with the RISC-V vector toolchain. Due to RISC-V being a relatively new architecture, working, work on the GNU toolchain has been in regular development. This posed issues for us as regular changes to the build system meant that there was no standard installation to follow, and a significant amount of experimentation was required. In addition to the use of Cadence's Exilium, the bring up process was further complicated due to the installation within the RHEL 7 Linux distro, a system setup we weren't as familiar with. Once our toolchain was operating successfully, we discovered that the state of the Xcore test bench, a key tool to run the software environment we required, was, a, was in an unusable state. As a mitigation, our, an alternative minimal test bench was developed by a researcher at TU Wien, and this helped ensure that hard, hardware development progress was on track. And in parallel, Mike Thompson of the Open Hardware Group helped us in bring up the X core test bench. In this process, we added the new construct, constructs required by the X interface onto the new test bench and removing all the old pulp connections left over from the supported key core test bench. But the key issue we encountered was with the virtual memory peripherals. Due to the migration over to a new test bench, the virtual peripheral memory addresses were changed and not updated for the previous core test bench. Given we weren't utilizing this new test bench, we reverted the file, uh, given with the pcore successfully restoring back to use. The extension interface consists of a number of sub-interfaces, each implemented in RTL to a different extent by the beginning of our project. The commit and subsequently memory sub-interfaces were specifically targeted for work due to their limited functionality and their relevance to our project. The commit interface is responsible for signaling the coprocessor to tell if an offload an instruction may continue execution or if it should be killed for some reason, such as if a branch was taken in the preceding instruction. The specific work involved for this use case is best expressed through an overview of the core's pipeline. Each sub-interface is associated with a specific stage in the pipeline, with offloading in the decode stage, committing of an instruction in the execute stage, and results returned to the core during the write-back stage. The separation of the commit and the issue interfaces here shows how the committing of an instruction is expected one cycle after the instruction offload. For the case of a preceding branch, however, this delay made writing of the conditional logic more troublesome. Despite the relevant flag being extracted, the value of this flag required buffering till the next clock cycle. This is due to this value being relevant not to the current extraction, but to the subsequent instruction being executed. As this flag would be overwritten the next cycle, registers were therefore needed to buffer its value. But such changes to the core's RTL were shied away from at first. However, the time that would be saved from eliminating such useless instructions and the reduced power consumption associated with this uh, made the addition of a register a worthwhile change. At this point, however, due to timing constraints, an executive decision had to be made to solely focus on the implementation of the memory interfaces. These allow for the coprocessor to access memory via the core's own load store unit. With the request and result, divided over two separate interfaces. Their implementation presented a key challenge for the project as no previous work existed at all for either. Now we'll look at these memory interfaces in some more detail. By connecting signals previously outputted from the AVA's vector load store unit over its direct path to system memory, with those required by the two memory sub-interfaces, these signals were matched up on the coprocessor side. These signals were also connected to the core's load store unit and decode logic was added here to convert certain signals within the memory request interface to a format usable when accessing memory. 
At this point in the project, however, the implementation of both memory subinterfaces seemed unlikely given the time constraints faced. Therefore, two possible paths for the continuation of this project stream were considered. The initial specification involved successful implementation of the memory subinterfaces, allowing for the AVA's direct memory access functionality to be removed. However, the memory interfaces were not tested to an extent where we were able to integrate them in the final system. As a contingency, it was planned early in the project for the integration of an external direct memory system using a memory arbiter. This allowed the system to be fully tested, reaching the same verification stage as the previous AVA project. In short, this memory arbiter unit exists between the X core and the accelerator core, giving read and write access privileges when either core requires it. Now, although the memory extension interfaces weren't successfully connected in time for integration, the issue and result interfaces were. A top level adapter module was created to convert the AVA accelerator signals to the signals communicated, communicated through the extension interface. One major fe feature introduced was the concept of handshaking within the issue interface. An acknowledged packet was to be sent back to the central core after an offload was requested. The packet contains information about the instructions, such as whether a write back was required. Next, the result interface was straightforward to integrate, returning the results of the accelerator to the core. The commit interface functionality, despite the additional work done, is in a minimal state, currently being tied off to always offload the instruction. This means that the accelerator, although integrated, is not yet fully compliant as the commit interface functionality does not yet exist. Testing was completed using the included AVA vector unit tests, passing all but one test involving the vector set vector length instruction, we would find out later that this had caused issues with the benchmark suite, revealing some bugs within the RTL. So I'll now touch on the actual software that can run on the system. So the AVACOL processor implements a subset of the RISC-V vector extension, which provides instructions that operate on vector rather than scalar data. And these are useful across multiple domains. For instance, to speed up matrix operations. Give a specific example, convolution, where a sliding filter is applied to a matrix can be expressed as a vector dot product between that filter and the subset of the matrix on which it is being applied. A previous investigation revealed that matrix operations, and especially convolution, make up the majority of computations involved in machine learning inference workloads. So this vectorization can have significant impacts on performance, even with only the select number of instructions from the vector extension that AVA actually implements. To evaluate the system's performance, specifically on inference workloads, we use the MLPerf Tiny Suite. This originated as a subset of the industry standard MLPerf, but tiny because it rests on the TensorFlow Lite micro framework to produce applications specifically engineered for microcontroller hardware with the limited resources of these devices taken into account. Each benchmark includes within it a pre-trained TF Lite neural network with an architecture suited for its particular task. The metrics we use to evaluate the system are accuracy and latency. And these measurements are only collected for the actual inference procedure. So any IO, any pre-processing or any post-processing that occurs in a realistic application is not actually considered for the latency calculations. From this suite of benchmarks, we use the visual wake word detection application. This uses an implementation of the mobile net V1 architecture, a convolutional neural network, and given an image, it will detect whether a person is present in frame. The benchmark runs two separate invocations, once with a person in frame and once without, to assess its performance in both cases. So we adapted this visual wake word benchmark to run on a target architecture, including when accelerated with vector instructions. Throughout the project, we use the Spike ISA simulator to develop and debug software for the target architecture before a hardware implementation was actually available. And you can see in the Spike results on the graph uh, that the expected speed up is achieved when vector instructions are employed. And we also collected the results for this benchmark on the E40X core. But unfortunately, the previously mentioned issues in the RTL implementation prevented us from running the benchmark on the accelerated core. So no results could be obtained for the complete system. To troubleshoot this issue, the AVA test suite included tests for the vectorized C functions in software. This test suite tested whether the RTL could support functions for the visual wake word benchmark. 
we found out it was unable to complete stalling due to issues with the program return. We examined this further and found that one likely cause was due to the structural changes with the register file uh, changing from the P to the X core. We added uh, an extra register write port and have tried reintegrating the same logic previously found within the P core, but have so far been unsuccessful. To track the system's real performance, our initial goals were to synthesize the system on the FPGA. Synthesis is designed to verify hardware before silicon Im implementation as part of the hardware development flow, revealing any timing issues which would not be detected by simulations alone. One of the drawbacks of the original 10-week AVA Masters project from last year was that they descoped work on hardware, running everything using only Verilator. Since then, AVA was synthesized together with a P-Core by Veronia Skandar, a PhD candidate at TU Dresden, as part of a 10-week Google Summer of Code project sponsored by Embercosm. Veronia discovered unresolved issues in the execution of test programs, so although our initial goal was to synthesize the X interface together with the AVA and the X-Core, this was quickly deemed an unrealistic target and descoped to just the X-Core. This is because the X interface has never been synthesized and resolving AVIS issues was deemed out of scope for such a short project. Nevertheless, we are able to verify the Xilinx Bivada tool flow by synthesizing a test program on AFPGAs, and we also synthesized the Open Hardware Group's Core 5 MCU. This is a microcontroller providing access to virtual peripherals for debugging cores using the GNU debugger via JTAG using a Digilent HS2 programming cable. However, key issues in development environment and time issues due to tight deadlines prevented further work. This project solved the real-world issue and contributed to the Open Hardware Group. We provided the most complete implementation of their ex uh, extension interface to date, simulated using Verilator, and with its memory sub-interfaces drafted and compiled. Successfully ported AVA using a partial extension interface to the new X core which we benchmarked using the industry standard MLPerf Tiny Suite. And we also synthesized the Core 5 MCU on an FPGA. This project provides a strong stepping stone towards the implementation and wider use of heterogeneous system architectures in the context of machine learning at the edge. Our project is a contribution to the Open Hardware Group and is available as an open source repository on GitHub. But of course, there is always more to do. So our immediate next task will be to resolve the RTL issue that we outlined, which is preventing us from executing the benchmark on the accelerated E40X. And beyond that, further, wo further work would include running more benchmarks from the MLPerf Tiny Suite to run on the system. So we can test other neural network architectures or in different inference workloads. To allow us to benchmark these different architectures and hardware, our next step would be then be to synthesize the system on the FPGA by replacing the P core with the X core within the Open Hardware Group's Core 5 MCU. Next, we would want to test and integrate the memory and memory result interface RTL, and therefore completing the full imp implementation of the X interface. Subsequently, our efforts would be directed towards developing the conditional logic behind the commit interface, adding to its functionality for killing offloaded instructions as and when the core requires. We'd like to finish by saying a huge thank you to everyone involved with the project and for giving us this incredible opportunity to contribute to the open source community. If you'd like to follow us and our progress, Please do connect with us via LinkedIn, email us directly if you have any questions or suggestions, and contribute further to the projects by checking them out on GitHub. And of course, feel free to ask any questions right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alana, Kunal, Adamus, you. Um, uh, so this has been uh, a good project to um, be the supervisor of. So thank you for your efforts. Um, but it is a, one of the things that has been uh, an interesting aspect of this project is it's been working on technology that is actively changing. And that's not something that often happens in master's projects. The X interface is still in the process of being specified and implemented. And it is a, has proved a useful exercise to be able to do the first implementation. Um, so, at 
uh, I, and I should say this is an ongoing program. We anticipate there will subject to approval. There will be Google Summer of Code projects to continue work on this program to build ever better, fully open and flexible uh, AI inference engines on the edge. Um, so we'll now open up uh, the meeting to general discussion and questions. So uh, to ask a question, either open up your microphone and ask it, or if you want to type it in the chat box, uh, whichever you find uh, more suitable. Um, so, um, questions, please. Yeah, hi there. Um, it's Simon, Simon. Here and Chris. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks. Very interesting presentation there for that. Uh, um, I, you know, I've been involved with the open hardware stuff for a long time. Our focus is the verification. Um, so, I had some questions. Um, um, you talked about the 40X, which is sort of the next generation core, and then the 40P, which is the previous generation core. And you talked about running them with Verilator. Um, sorry, actually, I probably, can I put a camera on? No, I can't. Yeah. Just sorry, it's a bit more polite to have my a bit more polite to have my camera on, isn't it? Yes, I mean there we are, there we are. it's coming. It, it's yeah, just okay. it's this open source technology, Simon. It just goes yeah. slow. Actually, sorry, no, this is this is a laptop, so it's not open source technology. But yeah, um, so yeah, so um, with the uh, forty x, so you talked about um a verilator. We've done a lot with verilator actually around verification to help people verify things. And did you did you say, oh, Anna, did you say you had the forty x running? through the Verilator stuff? Because I know there's a lot of talk, and I know Jeremy's been involved with running the MCU, which has the 40p in in Verilator, but I was I got a little bit confused. I wasn't quite sure which bits. So maybe you could explain your the simulation bits again, which which bits you were running and with verification with the, that you, sorry, that you used with Verilator, um, and, and whether that included the 40x and then the extension the ava extension you've added did it include that or was that done with the with the system verilog simulators um i'll, I'll be ha i'll be happy to take this uh, as i worked on kind of the tool chains um yeah so originally the intent was to use a commercial simulator as we weren't too sure whether verilator would support some of the constructs within the x interface um mm -hmm. however it it worked completely fine for our use and Due to some like uh, due to some like, licensing issues with Questasim, um, Verilator was the, mo the the consistent kind of simulator we use, as we didn't want to move our entire workflow onto um, a tool which we may not have access to. Yeah. So it was the X interface uh, as well as the 40X core fully simulated in Verilator with the core test bench. Okay, that's the core test bench, right? So that's the standalone. Yeah, no, no, I absolutely, uh, uh, it is always a can of worms to try and switch from simulator to simulator because even though Verilog System Verilog is a standard, it's a standard without a compliance suite, which means that all the implementations are slightly different in the corners. And especially if you're trying to do more complicated things, you can often get unstuck switching simulators. Um, and that's in the commercial world. That's what everybody they tend to use one and stick with it, and and end up living with the deficiencies in it. So yeah, I think you the, the, did the right thing, sticking with, with with the one and not trying to switch around. And yeah, and so and in terms of um, you didn't really mention the verification stuff there. And I remember asking this before. And actually, I I, I remember talking to Jeremy a year or two years ago about the original uh, master's project at uh, Southampton. And uh, it was decided not to to do too much um, uh, uh, sort of very sophisticated verification. I was wondering what you were doing now in terms of sort of verifying. I mean, I guess either the Ava bit or the interface, because the, the interface is changing, as as you rightly found. You know, so I just I'm curious about that part of the project. Yeah, um, I think so. Similarly to the previous project, um, we didn't focus too much on verification. Um, I think getting the design to just work in kind of a minimal sense was quite difficult um, already. Um, in terms of the test benching, um, we we had looked at using some sort of UVM verification flow, but again, it was kind of um, difficult given the short time period. Um, yeah. It's too um, heavyweight. It's too heavyweight for what you want. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> and again, that would push you back into the question rather than the very later stuff, which again, you don't want to move to. Yeah. No, yeah, I think fun, funnily enough, we ran into some um, construct, uh, some, some un unsupported constructs within Questa, which we didn't have with very later. Um, I don't know what happened there, but. As I said, because there isn't a compliance tree, every simulator makes makes their own decisions in the corners and um, they're all like that. You know, there's six or seven system relic simulators and they all have strange quirks in the corners and they, they won't fix them either. And the vendors just say, that's how it is. So, you know, you, you just end up living with that, I'm afraid. Yeah. Welcome okay. to the world of uh, it should be said the the quest to sim issue is is one that hit the previous project by a quirk of timing the license for quest to sim at southampton university renews in december which is three weeks before the end of the master's projects each year so it is always a risk that you may lose the quest to sim license just as you're getting to the the pressure stage so um if we could find a way to fix that that would be uh, really uh, rather good but it's um certainly that that's that was part of the factor there. Uh, thank you, Simon. Good questions. Um, uh, I see Hossein has typed his question. Um, is there any specific TF light, uh, so TensorFlow light uh, operation that you are not able to run on the system? Um, one of you like to pick that up? Yeah, I can uh, pick that up. So just to give maybe a little bit of context on things that we didn't quite cover uh, within TensorFlow light, one of the benefits of it is that it provides this a very modular kernel where we can swap out individual functions. So, for example, just swap out the uh, convolution operation um, when we want to, for example, test vectorized code running. So we just use handwritten assembly functions for something like convolution, and we can use that as part of the TensorFlow Lite framework. Uh, and that is very useful because it also comes with unit tests for each of these kernel operations. And using that, we did discover that the one um, operation that is uh, the source of the problems is the implementation of average pooling. So because we ran the visual wakeward benchmark, uh, the one of the last layers there is average pooling, and that was uh, the specific TensorFlow light operation that was giving us issues. That's how we discovered the source of the RTL uh, bug that was preventing it from running. Okay, that's a useful little piece of uh, process there, isn't it? The fact that TensorFlow light comes with a test bench yeah. of individual optimizers, a good example of where the software can test the hardware. That's good. And then we have, so Hussein, I hope that addresses your question. If you've obviously got more questions, just type them away. Uh, and then a question from Alistair Murray asking about, um, did you have to modify any of the software for your benchmarking or did it all just work? So I think the answer to that would be basically it all just worked, yes. So we could run the same, uh, instructions um, on both. In this case, I assume this means between the E40P core and the E40X core. I'm not too sure um, if that's the what this question is about. Is that modified between the P core and X core, just to clarify? I suspect it's going in a more abstract context. So just to put context on that, a lot of the software was developed a year ago for the previous project to run on the CV3340P. 3 and so this project was able to pick up that software. And I know last year um, um, they ran into considerable issues in getting the software to work. And thanks to the generosity of Google, we had uh, uh, Tim Ansell, Pete Warden and Tim Callahan hosting a two hour workshop last last year to get the software working on this platform. So I think this group has inherited that work. Um, does, so Alistair, is that the area you were where you were trying to ask a question about? I can see you're typing. Okay. Uh, but definitely, there definitely were issues around there. The, the If you look on the BCS Open Source Specialist Group YouTube channel, you will find last year's talk and uh, uh, from last year's project. And the way to find it is to sort the videos by popularity and it's the second most popular talk. So um, at least until presumably this talk goes out there. Um, so um, hopefully that then there'll be a bit more on that talk about what happened last year. So 
I, while, while others think, I, I have a, a question, which is to ask you to expound a bit more on the X interface. And the X interface is, is really important because it sets up the core five architecture as a very easy and flexible framework for adding custom instruction set extensions to risk five, which is the whole point of, of, of risk five. It means you can add a custom instruction set extension with a fair range of functionality without having to worry about touching the core. And I know that you, you know, you talked about the risk mitigation by picking up someone else's implementation. Was there anything you learned about the X interface that you'd want to share and that might guide how the X interface develops go, going forward? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to start on this. Um, so I think one of the aspects of the X interface that I think um, it was quite new to all of us in terms of interfacing between a core and a coprocessor was the commit interface, the idea of um, potentially um, killing an instruction that's been offloaded before it would otherwise finish execution. And um, um, yeah, I think we sort of understood uh, just how much time can be saved off that, um, like, like isn't with that additional interface in there. Um, as for how the interface would develop, I think that's why um, that was one of the points we wanted to come back to in our further work. Um, it's definitely something that we'd like to um, supplement further if we had the time, because we think it has a lot of potential in, um, yeah, in increasing um, computational efficiency. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else had anything else to add. Any other members of the team like to comment on that? And that's certainly you know, one of the things we were hoping to get out of this project was a, a more understanding on the practicalities of the X interface. So I think those thoughts are uh, uh, particularly uh, valuable. Um, I will just um, put a link to last year's video. Uh, so having mentioned it, I realise I can actually do that. Um, so if you just give it, uh, so I believe well, that's the video of the project last year. So particularly for Alistair, the maybe content in there that looks a bit more at the software. Um, so um, what I would say to people is, is to all those listening, for those of you who aren't part of the open hardware group, uh, do consider getting involved. Um, there, will be a proposal to say for Google Summer of Code projects again this summer in this field. So those are open to the the criteria have slightly widened this year for Google. So it's not just people who are students, but it can be anyone who is at the early stage of their career in this field, um, even if they're not actually a student. Okay. Um, so um, any more questions from anyone? Anyone like to ask anything more? So, uh, oh, Hussein's typing something. See, I'm not entirely sure. Yes. Okay, thanks for the great presentation. I think we'll all say that. Thank you all very much. So thank you to our three speakers. Um, we will go back to our all being well, to our regular face-to-face -face risk five meetups um, in April. It will be the uh, third um, uh, Monday uh, in uh, April. Um, uh, so we will um, reconvene then. Um, what I will do is I will leave the channel open um, for a little while. I'll turn off the recording or Sarah will turn off recording um, and we'll leave the channel open um, uh, for any conversation uh, uh, in the chat or you can turn your microphone on and chat if you wish to. But thank you all very much um, and thank you to the team of presenters. Good night.